being the physiological plasticity of corals across a depth gradient, starting from the very shallow regions of five meters down to um, 45 to 60 meters depth. And then we did a comparative analysis oh, of corals across a depth gradient, oh. starting from the very shallow region. Sorry, I'm having a feedback there. It's okay now, I see. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so then we repeated this experiment in Bermuda <laughs> where I was previously based uh, to look at how these patterns, if they persisted, across geographic locations. Um, so just for a bit of background about coral reefs and why we're interested in studying adaptation, uh, we all are aware that coral reefs have undergone drastic declines over the last several decades. And this has been particularly pronounced in the Caribbean where for example, coral reef cover has gone from on the order of 75 to 80% coral cover region wide in the late 1970s to its current state, which is roughly five to 10% cover region wide. And there are many impacts, um, both anthropogenic and environmental that have led to this decline. Those include things such as physical disturbance or hurricanes. So for example, one of the initial disturbances that caused um, a decline in the Caribbean was Hurricane Allen, which was a major, a major category four or five that hit um, the lower um, Florida Keys and the Lesser Antilles. Uh, but then we also have disease such as the die off of diadema or also coral diseases, which impact the survival of the corals. Overfishing plays a major impact in the survival of corals in terms of herbivores being removed from the reef and maintaining algal abundance. And then finally, we have bleaching, which is associated with increased sea surface temperature and global climate change effects. And all of these impacts have led to this decline in coral cover and have driven shifts in the abundances and species distributions across their geographic uh, ranges. So the main driver of all of this, I think that all coral reef scientists can agree is the increasing global sea surface temperature, which is resulting in coral bleaching. So we've seen an increase in global bleaching events through time as sea surface temperatures have risen in association with global climate change impacts. The first global bleaching event occurred in 1998, and then we had subsequent events in 2010, 2015, and have had several in the last few years uh, with these extreme thermal anomalies occurring now on an annual basis. The concern with bleaching is that corals are heavily reliant on a symbiosis with a single cell dinoflagellate algae, uh, which we call um, symbiodinium or zooxanthellae. And these zooxanthellae are temperature um, vulnerable to changes in temperature. And for example, if temperatures increase beyond on some tolerance, they become toxic to the animal host. This results in the host kicking out these algal cells. And eventually, if they are prolonged without this association, they will die due to starvation as the coral host can receive up to 90% of its metabolic needs from this association with the symbiotic algae. So this global coral bleaching has led to declines, but has also led to investigations of regions where corals may be able to survive, either in terms of adapting or evolving to this shift in temperatures towards higher thermal maximums, or by um, living in regions that do not experience these extreme heat events. And this has led to our studies, which are looking at marginal locations where corals exist as potential areas of refuge for coral species to survive. So one of these locations is Bermuda where I was previously working at the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences. Bermuda is located at 32 degrees north. It is the northernmost coral reef ecosystem in the Western Atlantic. It's subtropical uh, and so the temperature range is from roughly 15 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius in the peak of the summer. However, it rarely persists at this high of 30 degrees for more than about a week. 
um, in August and September. And so because of this, corals in Bermuda do not experience these extreme thermal maximums that are experienced elsewhere in the Caribbean. And if we look at a meta-analysis presented here of coral cover across the Caribbean, you can see that Bermuda here is represented by these green triangles. And if you look at the graph C, you can see that the locations represented in green triangles have maintained relatively high coral cover over the last several decades. So they have not experienced the same degree of decline as these other regions in the Central Caribbean. And we believe that this is partially due to the buffering of these thermal maximums and the fact that Bermuda does not experience these extreme temperatures and has never in fact had a major bleaching event resulting in mortality. Uh, and so this has led to the potential for Bermuda serving as a refuge as a marginal location. Now, similarly, a lot in Israel is also located in a northerly reef location. So it is the northernmost reef in the Red Sea. Um, you can see it circled here in the uh, map on the left. And in the graph or the map on the right, you can see the annual maximum temperature across the Red Sea where you have the Southern locations reaching a maximum temperature of roughly 34 degrees Celsius as compared to Israel or Elat in which this portion of the Red Sea only experiences a maximum temperature of roughly 28 degrees. And in fact, we can see a direct correlation with these temperature ranges and the prevalence of bleaching across the Red Sea where there is very little to no bleaching occurring in uh, the Gulf of Elat. And so again, Elat, similar to Bermuda, could be serving as a temperature refuge for coral survival. But this also requires corals to be able to adapt to these extreme fluctuations in temperature that are experienced in both locations. <clears throat> now, Areas of refuge can also exist across bathymetric ranges, not just latitudinal ranges. Um, and so when we were talking about this, we're referring to deep reefs or mesophotic coral ecosystems as potentially serving the same role as a refuge from thermal stress. Um, so we know that corals exist in these shallow environments and they're maintained by access to light and warm water and they persist in these locations but these also extend along the four reef zone into these mesophotic regions in which light becomes limited, um, but stressors such as pollution and high temperatures are also mitigated or buffered with depth. And so this has led many people to suggest that potentially these mesophotic reefs in the range of 30 to 200 meter depth could in fact also serve as a refuge for survival um, and persistence of biodiversity of corals. If we look at temperature across a depth grain, a rate, excuse me, range in Bermuda, for example, in the peak of the summer, we can see that in fact, reefs at 45 to 60 meters are on average two to three degrees Celsius cooler than the reefs at 10 meter depth. Um, and so this does show that in fact, they are buffered from these extreme temperature anomalies and generally do not experience the same um, range of temperature. So they are more stable overall on an annual basis. So this led uh, Dr. Mass and I to look at um, independently studies of how corals are thriving or even just surviving, adapting to life at these depths. So how do corals persist when they're living in light limited zones, such as the mesophotic reef. So some of our initial work in Bermuda was looking at the potential or really just looking at differences in morphology of these corals that we consider depth generalist species. So there are a wide range of corals. In fact, the majority of corals that live on shallow reefs can also persist on mesophotic reefs. And if we look at their skeletal morphology, in this study, we were comparing corals from five to 10 meters depth um, with corals from 55 to 60 meters depth. And you can see from the images here on the right, in image C is a coral colony from five meters depth and D is a coral colony from 60 meters depth. And just in this general image, you can see very clearly that 
each individual polyp is more widely spaced from the other in the mesophotic coral colony. But if we look at the actual structure of these skeletons even more closely in the graph on the bottom, you can see that we found that the height of those individual polyps also differed between depths. So the shallow corals have very tall polyps and the mesophotic corals have very shallow polyps. And we think that this is um, related to light availability where those corals on the mesophotic depth are increasing the surface area exposed to light in order to maximize photosynthesis in a light limited environment. Now, similarly in the Red Sea, this study was done in Bermuda and concurrently at the same time, uh, before Dr. Mass and I even knew each other, she was doing a very similar study on Stylophora pistillata across a depth gradient in Eilat. And so you can see here her images of Stylophora from five meters depth down to 60 meters depth. And again, just visually, you can very easily see that the morphology of these colonies is changing, whereas you have more closely uh, or tightly branched colonies in the shallows and more widely branched colonies in the, at depth. Again, we believe that this is an, an adaptation to light availability where they are maximizing exposure to light and minimizing self-shading among the various branches. Now, because these corals have been shown to vary so widely in their morphology across this depth gradient, particularly in a lot, some have suggested that perhaps, in fact, there is a species break at 40 meters. And these species, these individuals that we were finding at 40 to 60 meters may in fact be a subspecies of Stylophora pistillata. Um, however, when we looked at the genetic composition of, of these corals, we found that they fell within the same grouping across the depth gradient. So if we look at our tree on the right, you can see that samples from colonies at 5, 10, 25, 15, 50 meters, uh, and even 60 meters all fell within the same branch. Um, and so we can confirm that these are in fact the same species and not a subspecies. And this is important because this does show that in fact, this is um, a shift in morphology within the same species based on environmental conditions. But how or what are the mechanisms that are leading to these variations in morphology? Is this something that is inherited based on the conditions of the parent that it, the parent colony has experienced? Or are they a plastic response to conditions that they experience after the juvenile has settled here and begins to form a new colony? Um, so basically, is this physiological plasticity or is this evolutionary adaptation to these differences in environmental conditions? So to address this, Dr. Ma Dr. Mass and I joined forces and we were very thankful to be funded by Assemble Plus for my first visit to Israel. And we began our larvae from Stylophora pistillata across this depth gradient and looking at how the morphology and physiology differed between both adults and the larvae or the, the next generation. And could we decipher um, if they shifted their response based on where their parent was from or was it just based on where we put them as juveniles? We then were very fortunate to again receive um, funding from the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences to bring tally to BIOS and we repeated the experiment in Bermuda. So first of all, what we did was we traveled to Israel and we collected larvae in situ. Um, so the images on the right are um, the methods that we did in Israel. So in Israel, the lab is right along the, the reef slope. You can walk in from the front of the lab and descend to 60 meters on a steep slope. This makes collections very easy. So we were able to go out in the evening and put out these larval collection nets and go back the next morning to retrieve them. And they would have larvae in these little jars that you can see on the top of the nets. In Bermuda, however, the reef is seven miles offshore. So this makes collections a little bit more difficult. The reef slope is very gradual, which means that all of our decompression diving was in blue, um, blue water. And so we had to bring the corals into the lab. 
So we would bring adult coral colonies into the lab and collect their larvae on a table like you can see in the bottom left image. And we would use a series of filters over these jugs to maintain a light level that reflected either mesophotic or shallow water conditions. When we retrieved the larvae the next morning, we would then measure them for size. So looking for differences in physiology between shallow and deep larvae, we would measure both major and minor axes and calculate larval volume. We then took a subset of the larvae into the lab and looked at fluorescence using an inverted phase contrast fluorescence microscope. Um, and then we were able to look at fluorescence of both chlorophyll and green fluorescent proteins or GFPs. A second subset was then used for RNA analysis looking for GFP expression between shallow and deep larvae. A second subset of the larvae was then taken and allocated between two different uh, depths. So we would put them into these closed chambers with mesh sides and half of them went onto the mesophotic reef and half of them went onto the shallow reef. And we went back five days later and collected these little chambers to count how many larvae had settled in the various depths. Um, in a lot, we did not get enough larvae from the deep corals in order to do a reciprocal transplant. And so we only did this with the shallow larvae. So shallow larvae were settled at shallow and mesophotic depth. In Bermuda, we were able to get enough larvae that we were able to do a cross um, transplant. And we also repeated it in the lab, which turned out to be um, extremely critical because some of our um, settlement chambers um, were opened and we lost a lot of the larvae. And so this is a methodology that we are tweaking as we move forward with this experiment. Uh, but we are lucky that we did it also ex situ in our mesocosm facility. Um, and so we do have comparable data for the settlement in Bermuda. Once they settled, we then uh, looked at them under a dissecting microscope and were able to measure their surface area and, and compare that amongst site of origin and site of settlement. And in Israel, we also use scanning electron microscopy to look at skeletal formation of these initial stage juveniles. All right, so what we found was actually quite interesting. We found a, the complete opposite result in terms of larval size between Stylophora pistillata in Israel and Parides asteroides in Bermuda. So in Israel, we found that the larvae from the shallow corals were significantly larger than the larvae produced by these deep corals. And in contrast, in Bermuda, we found smaller larvae produced by shallow corals compared to larger larvae from the deep corals. Now, one potential explanation for this could be light availability or differential light availability among these two geographic locations, whereas you recall from those maps, a lot is in um, the very tip of the Red Sea. It's a rather enclosed location compared to Bermuda, which is open ocean. Um, and so the light penetration in Bermuda is likely um, deeper than that in a lot. Um, the water clarity is much greater in Bermuda. So perhaps on these mesophotic reefs, they are in fact getting more energy from photosynthesis um, on for the mesophotic corals compared to the mesophotic corals in a lot, which could translate into how much energy is being put into reproduction, resulting in differential larval sizes. If we look at the fluorescence, um, this pattern was quite interesting. So we look at the shallow larvae are in images C, D, and E, whereas the deep larvae are in images F, G, and H. And you can see that in the shallow larvae, we have a higher um, fluorescence of GFPs, which are expressed as green, whereas in the deep larvae, we had a higher expression of chlorophyll, which are expressed as red. And if we look at the results of our RNA expression, we see the same thing. So a higher overall expression of GFPs on shallow corals um, in shallow larvae compared to the mesophotic larvae. Now GFPs are, have been suggested to serve as a type of photoprotection for corals. Uh, because they will reflect high, v, high UV radiation. And so this supports that potential role of GFPs um, because potentially these shallow larvae are in fact 
producing more GFPs because they are exposed to higher UV light than the mesophotic larvae. While the mesophotic larvae have higher chlorophyll expression, again, likely due to differential light availability, where this higher chlorophyll will result in higher photosynthetic efficiency and more translocation of energy for these larvae in a light limited environment. If we look at settlement across the different depths, remember in Israel, we only had shallow larvae and so they were settled in both shallow and deep zones. And you can see that there's a trend towards higher settlement and survival in the shallow site, but this difference was not statistically significant. If we look at Bermuda, however, where we were able to do a cross transplantation, um, we find a different result here where we see that coral, the larvae that are produced by the mesophotic corals tend to have higher settlement and survival than those that were produced by the shallow corals. And uh, both groups, in fact, tended to have higher settlement on these mesophotic reefs in Bermuda compared to the shallow reefs. Um, and this, again, may indicate a difference in light availability between mesophotic reefs in Ella and Bermuda. And so that is sort of the next step is we really need to start to investigate um, these light regimes between the two locations. One thing to note is that the survival, for example, is significantly higher than settlement. Uh, and this indicates that in fact, we may have checked settlement too early as there are, were a lot of larvae still swimming in our chambers at the five day mark. Um, and so going forward, we would probably extend the amount of time that we allowed for these larvae to settle. And finally, looking at polyp, juvenile polyp morphology, we did not find any significant differences in the morphology um, or the size of these initial spat between um, either site of origin. So whether the parent was from shallow or deep or where they were settled, but you can see that there's a slight trend towards larger spat um, from deep corals and when settled at mesophotic, in mesophotic conditions. And we did see differences in skeletal formation using the SEM. So the top image A is from a mesophotic spat and the bottom image C is from a shallow spat. And you can see that in fact, again, we find that the septa are more widely spaced on those deep spat compared to the shallow spat. And if we look towards the images on the right, these are the blow out of these small little orange boxes. And you can see that the spires are more um, complex in the shallow spat than the deep spat. And this conforms to those patterns that we found um, with the adults that we looked at, um, which may indicate that in fact, the morphology that's taken on by the adult it is initiated by the habitat experienced during the juvenile stage. So in conclusion, we found that reproductive patterns um, in response to depth differed between our two locations. And we think that this is probably um, a result of differences in light penetration between an open ocean environment and an enclosed bay. We also found differences in settlement and survival across depth. Um, where we had higher settlement and survival for Misa, Misa in Israel. And finally, we found that patterns of skeletal formation also differed between depths in Israel, um, which we think also could be due to differences in reliance on uh, heterotrophy versus autotrophy. And in fact, some stable isotope analysis that um, Tally's lab has just completed and published confirmed that in fact, there is a shift towards a, a larger reliance on heterotrophy for these mesophotic corals, which could be why um, they have these sort of larger, more broadly spaced polyps, which would facilitate grabbing small little zooplankton swimming by. Um, so all of this indicates that in fact, environmental conditions are extremely important in driving differential patterns of reproduction and settlement and growth. And the next step is to do some genomic analyses and look at gene expression or variations in gene expression amongst um, these juvenile stages and repeat our reciprocal translocation experiments in a lot to hope to get a, a more fine-tuned answer to the mechanisms driving these adaptations across depth. And we want to thank everyone and open it up to questions. Thank you very much, Gretchen. So any questions, uh, please uh, add them to the chat so we know. Um,
well, maybe I'll ask you a question. You mentioned that uh, you know hurricanes and so on can destroy these corals. I mean, how long does it take for for, for recovery? I mean, it will, and of course, with the the problem of uh, right. increase, uh, probably it's a compounded problem. Um, depending on the degree of damage done by a hurricane, it can take a decade for a reef to recover completely from such an event. Um, interestingly, a lot of the more vulnerable corals to physical damage, which are the large branching corals, can actually reproduce or fragment and then become lodged in the reef and establish themselves again. So even though they are the more vulnerable in types of species towards breaking in a storm, they are also um, more likely to be able to spread out and survive post a storm, whereas those large boulder, boulder corals, if they are destroyed in a storm, they are more heavily reliant on reproduction, uh, sexual reproduction in the next generation to replenish themselves. Um, and so there is a lag in recovery in terms of reaching that uh, point of peak biodiversity for sure. And, and I would say it's on the order of a decade or so. Mm. Uh, in fact, I'm thinking about something else as well, is after listening this morning to the, our first talk, where we're talking about, well, well the talk was about um, interspecific diversity. And the, I'm just thinking about the comparisons you are making. In, uh, you know, in the Caribbean, it's a more open system compared to uh, Elat, where you have kind of the end of a, uh, you know, of a stretch of water. Uh, mm -hmm. whether differences in genetic diversity may exist, uh, which could also, uh, you know, explain some of the differences in, in observations. Uh, yes. In fact, we have, um, both Tally and I have independently done analyses of uh, genetic diversity in Bermuda and a lot. Um, and Bermuda remarkably has low genetic diversity. And it seems that because of its geographic isolation from the Caribbean. Uh, so some of the species, for example, um, the small brooding corals, we have found very little genetic diversity in Bermuda, whereas those that are from broadcasting species would have high genetic diversity. I expect it would be somewhat similar, but a lot is much more of a bottleneck than Bermuda would be. Um, and so this would potentially drive differences in these gene expression results that we will find in the future because we may find that corals in Bermuda because they have a higher diversity, have a higher uh, capacity to respond to change than those that are so well adapted and have evolved to uh, a very specific environmental condition which is experienced in a lot. Um, and so if they experience a shift they may not have that diversity within the population that would facilitate um, adaptation or uh, acclimatization to differential conditions. So yes, I agree that that could Thank definitely you. play a role in our results. Very good. Thank you very much uh, for, you. for your contribution. Uh, there's a, hang on, there is a question here. A question. We can probably take it. Marcio, you can ask your question. Hi. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I was just wondering if your groups or if there is any published literature on um, differences in reproductive phenology uh, across depths and across species that could be could explain the differences in set larval settlement and survival, things like lipid reserves and that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, we've done some initial work in Bermuda. Um, it was just published in 2019 and we were looking at um, exactly what you're talking about. So larval size, the number of larvae produced per surface area of individual corals, lipid content. Um, and in fact, we they seem to do, or they seem to have a higher reproductive capacity at about the 30 meter depth zone, um, which I think indicates again, this that there is, that this is an optimal depth in Bermuda whereas it may not be the case in a lot. Um, Dr. Mass and I definitely have intentions of looking at uh, fecundity and more aspects of lipid content and that sort of thing, and as well as expression within larvae in a lot going forward, um, but we haven't done it as of yet. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we, oh, Ashwin. 
No, no, it's, it's just a comment. Okay. Um, we go uh, forward to the next speaker, and that is uh, Carl Carano from San Diego State University. He's a professor there at San Diego State University, and he has, uh, you know, lots of publications on bio and organic chemistry. And uh, in the Assemble Plus project, he visited SAMS uh, up in Scotland, and SAMS is one of the members of, uh, of MBRC UK. So Carl is going to speak about laminaria kelps impact iodine speciation chemistry in coastal seawater. Thank you, Carl, particularly because you're coming from the other side of the Pacific, you know, in the, the West Coast, and it's very early morning over there. Thank you. Okay, well, let's see if I can figure out how to get this to work, however. You just All click right. on share screen, and then you choose your share file. Screen. At the bottom of the, of the... We've got... Okay, let's see. And then you choose the file. Choose your file. we got to get my thing over here, which is on, right over here. here I should have opened, you should have opened the file first. Oh, okay. there you go. There it is. There it goes. Uh, let's see here. Just right click. From the beginning. Okay, everybody see that? Perfect. Okay, so we're good. All right. Well, thank you, first of all, for the invitation. And what I want to talk about a little bit today is actually two separate, uh, distinct, but closely related uh, projects that were funded uh, by Assemble. And so we're very grateful uh, for that uh, opportunity to get this funding. Uh, and what I want to talk about is something a little different here, and that is uh, the... Uh, chemistry of a trace element, uh, particularly in uh, iodine, and the uh, role that uh, marine macroalgae, brown algae, the kelps, have on uh, changing and uh, ad adapting to the speciation of, uh, of that chemistry of that uh, iodine in seawater. So uh, let us start here. Uh, by saying, first of all, that iodine is a trace uh, element uh, with a very complex biogeochemistry, okay? So I don't obviously expect you to get much out of this slide. It's much, much too busy. But the point of the slide is that this element, uh, trace element iodine, has a very complex biogeochemistry, uh, and it's impinges on a variety of different uh, factors. Now, uh, if we just focus on iron and seawater, we find that uh, the concentration of iodine in seawater is roughly, uh, is constant typically at around 450 to 550 nanomolar. And all of this iodine occurs in two basic forms, either uh, the oxidized version of iodine, which is iodate, IO3 minus, or the reduced form, uh, I minus or iodide. The former, the iodate has a typically concentration around 400 nanomolar. That is to say, it's the majority of the iodine is in its oxidized form. Uh, while that of iodide is around 100 nanomolar, if you look at large uh, variety of studies that have been done over a variety of different uh, seawater basins. Now, iodate, however, is the thermodynamically stable form, okay? And under normal seawater conditions, there really shouldn't be anything but iodate present, okay? Iodide is uh, something that is the reduced form is not the thermodynamically stable form. Uh, and however, what we find is that the concentration of iodate varies tremendously depending on the depth. And uh, what we find is that it's iodate concentrations are typically, hang on for one minute as I move this thing out of my way, um, that, Iodate concentrations are low at the surface and increase with uh, depth, while iodide concentrations follow the reverse pattern. 
being anomalously accumulated in the aphotic zone and decreasing uh, with depths. So the fact that the iodide concentrations follow a depth dependence that corresponds to the aphotic zone suggests that biological activity is the source of this reduced iodine, which thermodynamically shouldn't be there, okay? Uh, but the nature and the source of the reduction activity remains uh, somewhat of a mystery. And a variety of different things, bacteria, phytoplankton, uh, abiological processes, and macroalgae have all been uh, suggested to, to be important sources for the reduction of this iodate to iodide. So, what do we know? Well, I want to focus now on our what we're interested in, particularly are in the macroalgae, the so-called uh, seaweeds or kelps. Um, the uh, laminarials, the kelps are in fact a my major biogeochemical pump of iodine. In fact, if you see the little picture on the right, which is one of my collaborators, Fritjof Cooper, if you pick up some of these uh, macroalgae and smell it, you can smell the iodine. They're just chock full of iodine. And in fact, they are the strongest iodine accumulators known in biology. And they can increase, they can uh, accumulate iodine up to 10,000 fold or greater over that of the seawater concentration. So where the seawater concentrations are in an animal range in uh, the algae, these macroalgae, uh, the iodine reaches levels in the millimolar range. Uh, and this iodine is thought to, when it's accumulated, is thought to be uh, accumulated in the form of iodide, but there's a question about whether or not they can also take up iodate. And that's a question I'll, I'll come back to in a moment. Now, kelps take up an efflux iodine. The reason that they accumulate so much iodine is supposedly as an oxidative stress response. So actually iodine uptake requires low levels of hydrogen peroxide or oxidants, typically less than 25 millimolar to take up uh, iodine. I'm not gonna talk about the uptake mechanism at all. Uh, that's generally well known, has been published. But at high concentrations of oxidants such as hydrogen peroxide, which result from an oxidative burst, which is an actually an innate uh, immune defense reaction that these algae use when they're challenged by bacteria. Uh, the way they uh, respond is in an immune reaction is to have this oxidative burst of hydrogen peroxide, which kills off the bacteria. But now we've got this, uh, a lot of this oxidant around and what happens is that the algae then efflux iodide to go the opposite direction. Instead of taking it up, they now use that stored iodine to efflux and react with the hydrogen peroxide and detoxify it. Um, and this uh, oxidative reaction, let me just get this out of my way again. Uh, also, the desiccation, high temperature, high radiance, and exposure to atmospheric oxidants at low tide also lead to efflux. So we've got both from uh, bacteria, uh, algae that are challenged by bacteria or by environmental factors that efflux iodide. And then this iodine ultimately winds up in the form of, of iodine emissions. And that's what you can actually smell uh, in these uh, cases where the iodine, either in the form of organic iodide species or inorganic iodide species, uh, are emitted uh, into the water or the atmosphere. So first of all, I should say something about why, could, why should we care? Who cares what happens with iodine and macroalgae? Well, there are a number of reasons why this uh, is an important subject. Uh, first of all, there's impacts on atmospheric chemistry and therefore potentially climate. So, uh, and this relates to what I just mentioned a minute ago. Uh, 
is that these algae, when they are oxidatively stressed, begin to emit or efflux iodine. Iodine then can interact with uh, atmospheric oxidants such as ozone. Uh, and this process ultimately leads to uh, species that are iodine oxides, which then form as nucleation sites for clouds. And in certain parts of the world, for example, in the coasts of Ireland and parts of the coast of France, uh, you see these uh, fogs around the coastline that are not really fogs, they're actually impacts uh, by the fact that these algae are producing uh, these cloud nucleation sites. Uh, another area that we're kind of interested in from an inorganic point of view is the evolution of innate immunity and oxidative stress responses. And if you think about that, one of the sort of paradigms of evolutionary history, if you will, is that most of the reactions that uh, we're now that are now catalyzed by organic molecules, by proteins and enzymes, probably in at the beginning had their uh, origins in probably many of them were just simple inorganic catalysis processes. And the brown algae or the kelps are a very old lineage. And it turns out that their innate immunity and oxidative stress response is a strictly inorganic one, okay? There are no uh, enzymes involved. There are these reactions uh, that are, are all inorganic and they may be able to then tell us something about the evolutionary history of innate immunity. For example, we also know that in our own human systems that uh, some of the innate immune response are involved in using uh, hypochlorite, et cetera, uh, from macrophages may be part of the uh, leftovers, if you will, from this very begins, beginning of inorganic uh, innate immune response. Uh, another practical application uh, is that these organisms can function as biological dosimeters for uh, fission products such as radioactive iodine-131. Uh, there's an interesting case where during the Fukushima uh, disaster uh, of a, several years ago, it was possible to measure how fast the fission products that were released into the atmosphere and the ocean uh, made it to the coast of California by monitoring iodine in these, uh, particularly these algae, such as Macrocystis pyrifera. And then of course, finally, there's, uh, it has a role in human health and nutrition. Of course, uh, we require iodine uh, because it's a component of uh, hormones such as thyroxin. Uh, and uh, as additionally, obviously, uh, the brown algae are a major food source in, uh, in Asia. Uh, you know, if you've had sushi, you've been eating brown algae uh, that are once again very rich in iodine. So there's interest from it from that perspective. Now, our original work was we're generally, like I said, I'm an inorganic chemist, and we normally work in the laboratory. Uh, and most of the work on iodine uptake and emission had been done in a laboratory setting, but we were interested in whether or not we could confirm that these kinds of effects occurred in the field, not just in a laboratory. And in the coast of California, where I am based, uh, the major uh, macroalgae is the soap giant kelp, uh, macrocystis. And we studied uh, two sites uh, at the coast of, on the coast of California, um, to see if iodine speciation in the seawater was actually being affected uh, by these macroalgae. So we started a year-long study and we looked at two sites. One site that was uh, algae-free, didn't have any algal pr present, uh, uh, which was near uh, uh, in, where was that? In, at Scripps Pier in uh, La Jolla, California. And then we looked at another site, uh, which was off a Point Loma in San Diego, which is a area that is, has the giant kelp forest. Uh, 
that was actually commercially uh, where kelp was commercially harvested until a few years ago. And what we found was by doing this seasonal water sampling over an entire year, uh, we used uh, a electrochemical method, cathodic stripping square wave voltammetry is not important uh, what we're doing there, uh, but we measured both iodide and iodate concentrations. And if we looked at the kelp free reference site, we saw that the iodate and iodide concentrations essentially remained unchanged throughout the year. However, when we looked uh, at the same uh, sites, which are only uh, a few miles apart, and we looked at iodate and iodide co concentrations around the kelp forest, we found major changes depending on the season. So they were strongly related to changes in the kelp canopy biomass. And in particular, iodide reached a highest concentration and iodate its lowest concentration during the summer when kelp canopies were near their maximum. And uh, the opposite pattern was observed during the winter and spring when the kelp canopies were near their minimum. So our question uh, that we wanted to answer was if we looked at a different kelp species in a completely different uh, geographical area, so an underlying unlike California, where the major species is Macrocystis, uh, the major species in the North Atlantic is a species of various species of laminaria. And we wanted to know, do they also affect the iodine speciation in uh, the North Atlantic coastal ocean? And we looked at two sites. These were two separate, as I said, but related uh, assemble projects. Uh, we looked at kelp forest in Brittany, near Roscoff uh, in France, where there are very extensive uh, kelp forests that are subject to extreme oxidative stress due to very low uh, tides and are dominated by various species of laminaria rather than macrocystis. Uh, and so you can see down here some pictures of that general area uh, where in fact kelp's still being harvested, uh, but at low tide, these kelps are actually uh, exposed to the atmosphere, which is not the case in California where um, the macrocystis forests are never subject to, to that kind of stress. And the second uh, place that we wanted to look at uh, was can we detect changes in seawater iodine speciation in less extensive, less oxidatively stressed, but still laminaria dominated kelp forests, uh, such as those around uh, Oban in Scotland. So in uh, Scotland, we were working uh, with uh, the uh, Scottish Association of Marine Science, which uh, if you look down here is sort of over here, you can't see it. This is Dunstaffnage Castle. Uh, and uh, we sampled uh, various laminaria along this, this channel on both sides of this channel uh, where they, the forests are here are the algae, the macroalgae are very large, uh, but they're not as extensive and there's not such strong tidal influences. Now the weather was really pretty crummy uh, like this picture. Uh, so we had uh, some difficulty in uh, being able to do this because here we were trying to sample uh, the water right at the surface of the algae. Uh, by using divers and syringe methods, we wanted to look at the actually right up against the algae. Do we can we detect changes in the seawater chemistry? Uh, and so up here we have a picture. This is uh, Fritjof, my collaborator, collecting uh, samples by syringe. Down here is Joanna Brooks, who was a diver for Tritonia, which was another part of our assemble project. Uh, and collecting uh, water samples by syringe. Whoops. So uh, if we, once again, it's not important to see these details here. Uh, this, uh, we had uh, 16 reference sites, uh, sampling sites uh, over the course of several weeks uh, in Roscoff. Uh, and what we find, so here's the data that we've just finished uh, accumulating. 
So we have these 16 uh, sites. Um, what we have in Roscoff is of this over this area over here with this black line above it are six sites uh, that were measured at uh, low tide. And you see that this is iodide concentrations that I'm measuring here. So you see that the iodide concentration at low tides uh, around 300 uh, nanomolar. Now this is very, very elevated compared to what I showed you earlier that the normal seawater iodide concentration is typically around 100 nanomolar. So at low tide, we have this very high level of iodide being present in the seawater. Uh, over here under this uh, red line, uh, we have uh, the high tide samples. And at high tide, uh, the concentration of iodide uh, was about 160 nanomolar, which is closer to what you would expect. And over here under this blue line, these are our control sites where we've taken uh, water samples well away from where the kelp was. And the numbers there is about 118 nanomolar, which is pretty close to what you would normally expect. So what does that tell us? Well, you look over here on the right, you can see here's the control, 118 nanomolar, high tide, 162 nanomolar, low tide, 286 nanomolar, uh, these are statistically significantly different uh, that show that the uh, at low tide, we have a massively increased amount of iodide in the seawater as compared to the high tide or the open water control sites. And this was a, uh, somewhat of a surprise that, that the, these algal, this macroalgae could affect the seawater concentration of iodide to such a major degree. Uh, if we look now at the other form of iodine, which is iodate, which is typically present at the highest concentration, we see uh, that the uh, average concentration for iodate is about 185. Uh, there was no statistically significant difference between high tide, low tide, or what laminaria species were present. Uh, but the big difference again is that this 185 is much, much lower than we would normally expect it to be, which I said typically normal seawater is about 400. So we've got very much less iodite than uh, we expected. Uh, and again, the control sites are higher. Uh, they have more iodate closer to what you would expect. Uh, we can then go on to uh, look at uh, what we saw from our other sampling site, which is in Oban. And in Oban, we looked at, if you look at iodide over here, uh, we did these, remember, now by just uh, syringe sampling. So we're looking right at directly at the water next to the um, uh, algae we find that uh, the iodide levels are not nearly as high as they were in Roscoff. Uh, they're somewhere between around a little under 200 nanomolar. Uh, and we were able to also look at different parts of the plant, whether we're looking at the holdfast, which is the sort of, you wanna call it the, the roots, obviously it's, these are not the ter terrestrial plants, but the phyloids or blades, which are like leaves, uh, we can sample the different areas there. And we see basically that iodide concentrations were not strongly affected. However, iodate concentrations, again, were extremely low right next to the algae. So here we have iodate over here, uh, iodate concentrations. We didn't see any difference between the holdfast and the phyloids, but what we did see is that iodate concentrations now were something around 75 nanomolar, which is uh, far, far less than open water iodate concentrations, which are like, like I said, typically around 400. So there was a huge difference in uh, the amount of iodate uh, concentration uh, near this uh, macroalgae. So uh, what can we conclude uh, from these studies is that clearly under conditions of oxidative stress, 
particularly low tide, high temperature. Uh, iodide concentrations in the seawater surrounding kelp forests are considerably elevated from the values expected, either in open ocean or kelp-free coastal water. And I can say that we see pretty much exactly the same pattern in California as we saw from this new data that we collected in Europe. Uh, and the most obvious case though was in Roscoff where we had these extremely low tides and the algae are actually exposed to uh, atmospheric uh, desiccation and oxidative, uh, oxidative stress. And there the effect on iodine is very dramatic as iodide is uh, emitted into the ocean and actually increased tremendously the iodide concentration. Correspondingly, iodate concentrations in around the kelp forest are dramatically lower than expected, just the opposite. Uh, there's not a simple one-to-one -one correspondence between iodate and iodide, suggesting that the effect is not just due to uh, changes in speciation, but is in fact, there's so much iodate is removed from the seawater, uh, suggesting that it's actually being taken up. And so that question I mentioned about what is the form of iodide that's actually being uh, taken up is in fact, uh, it looks like not only is iodide taken up, which has been confirmed in laboratory studies, but it looks like iodate is also taken up based on what we see uh, in these field studies as well. So finally, it's the end of the day for you all. It's the beginning of the day for me, but this is the last talk I believe for the day. So let's, I will end it here. And uh, just some quick acknowledgements. Uh, Martin Sayer and his staff at Tritonian Oban, uh, Joanna Brooks, who's one of the divers, uh, the staff at uh, both SAMS and the Station Biologic uh, Roscoff. And I also should thank the NSF, which uh, supported my work in the United States. Uh, I had a uh, Hansa Wissenschaft College uh, fellowship, which allowed me to be in Europe and take advantage of this assemble funding for which I am very grateful. Uh, and I will end it there. Thank you, Carl, uh, for this very interesting presentation. Certainly it's not uh, something that we, at least not me, um, um, I wasn't aware of some of the things you said. And in fact, it's, uh, I'm just wondering, so did this, this algae release all this uh, iodide? I mean, what next? I, I presume this has, I'm not sure if you can answer the question, but this will have some cost. The algae will, will probably need to recover for the next tide. Um, so uh, I, I presume there'll be some costs on this, but uh, uh, I don't know exactly what the implications are, or if you know uh, if so, what, what may be some of the implications for the physiology. Well, I think uh, it, it, it's really a cycle, if you will. Okay, I used to have, I should have pr probably put that in there. Uh, it's what's, what appears to happen is that under oxidative stress, they uh, efflux the iodide into the ocean. At the same time, they're also it, replenishing their stores of this iodide by taking up iodate is what it looks like. Uh -huh. Because that, that's going down while the other's going up, okay? And so during the non-stress conditions, iodine is being accumulated to a very high degree. Uh, like I said, at least 10,000 fold over the seawater is stored and then is then effluxed when they're stressed by either bacterial attack or by uh, oxidative stress. And so the process is the iodine is, a, is cycled, if you will, in and out, depending on the situation. Very good. Thank you. So uh, there, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, so thank you very much, Carl. That was Excellent, and uh, thanks for being up early. Uh, so also, I would like to thank all the speakers and, uh, and also the, the, you know, the, the ones that are listening. Um, tomorrow, we, we're going to have at 12 o'clock a presentation about the IUI. You heard already before, uh, you know, the, the visit of Gretchen that uh, visit IUI. UI is a very interesting place, and I, you know the presentation tomorrow will show the capacities that are there uh, to do research. So I, I invite you to be at 12 o'clock Paris time, so Central European time, 
uh, you know, to log in uh, so that you can uh, see what, how this can help you also in your research eventually to go to Israel and uh, through Assemble or the future Assemble and, uh, and, and, and basically advance your work. So thank you very much and hope to see you in the next, to tomorrow and, and the next days. At NHBS, our purpose is to support those who are passionate about wildlife, ecology and conservation. We stock a variety of books and equipment to suit the needs of marine conservation professionals and our innovation and research team are here to help develop custom products for any project. We are happy to provide advice and to support you before, during and after your purchase. Visit nhbs.com today to find out more. <laughs>